So now I'm going to hand over to Sarah and Stephen. Awesome. Thanks, Grania. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce a fellow person from Limerick, although now living in Spain, uh, Stephen Clancy. Stephen is a professional cyclist with type 1 diabetes for Team Novo Nordis, the only professional all diabetes cycling team, in case, you know, as a T1D, you haven't heard of it before. Um, he was diagnosed with type 1 when he was just 19 years old. And surprisingly, he only took up competitive cycling when he was 16. And at the time of his diagnosis, he had already had a number of awards, including Cycling Ireland's Domestic Rider of the Year. Um, with his type 1 diabetes diagnosis, there was a serious doubt in his future cycling career, but he didn't let that slow him down. Just six months after his diagnosis, Stephen became a member, again, of the only diabetes cycling team, Team Type 1. Additionally, a personal huge congratulations to Stephen and his wife, who married this past summer and are expecting their first child in 2021. Um, we'd like to thank Novo Dordis for sponsoring Stephen Clancy's appearance here today at Thrive Bees. We will take questions from you for Stephen to answer, so please put those in the general chat box. So get ready, turn your computer volume up, and let's learn from Stephen about life with diabetes as a professional athlete. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah, for a great introduction. And of course, Gronia, all the panelists for your, your time, your effort, your important advice, and all the viewers, of course. But uh, yeah, I guess without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce, obviously, as you know, my name is Stephen Clancy, part of this uh, crazy team, you could say, the, the world's first all diabetes pro cycling team. I guess when, when the founder, Phil Sutherland, was setting it up, uh, people were like, are you mad? You know, <laughs> is this a crazy idea, you know, to set up a professional sports team and not, not any sport, a demanding sport with, with diabetes, but, but here we are. And I was actually only just reading a, an interview with, with Ed Sheeran the other day about how he feels uncomfortable doing any interviews in front of any camera without his guitar. So my equivalent is sticking my jersey up here in the corner over my shoulder as a, it's not only a sponsor plug, but it's as close as I'll get without uh, sitting on a bike with my helmet on. But uh, so yeah, so yeah, Limerick native myself, as uh, you heard, I've, I've long lost my accent traveling around the world with the team and now based in Spain, as you heard. Um, but if I just backtrack a little bit about my own upbringing story, diagnosis and whatnot, um, yeah, I, I, I led a, a sporty childhood, you know, trying many, many different sports growing up. Um, I tried some golf, but could never, could never string together 18 holes in a row. It was in a row. There was far too much walking, a bit of rugby, a bit of soccer. Um, I had some knee injury playing soccer. I was a forward in, in soccer, so I, when I did the trials for the rugby team as a forward, I thought I was a forward. Uh, it didn't work out so well, but I finally ended up buying a bike um, when I was around 15, 16 years old, um, mainly because we used to go on the family holiday every year to France um, on the ferry with the car, with the surfboards, laden down with, with wine and everything. Uh, it was a sight to behold. But uh, try and clock up as many as many miles as I could on the bike over there and the, the beautiful weather, the beautiful roads. Um, so coming back, bought the road bike, entered a, a local race. The owner of the bike shop in Limerick was running a, a time trial. It's like a race against the clock. Um, and I won it. I, if I remember correctly, there was only two or three guys in my category, but a win's a win. So that was me hooked effectively. You know, I thought, oh, this is, this is a sport that I could, I could live with uh, going forward. And, I'm not going to say immediately I decided to pursue it as a career, but I loved it. You know, it was a passion without, about, without a doubt. So, I mean, I, for the seasons after that, uh, the cycling season, I, I was reliant on my parents at the time, driving around all, all the country of Ireland, attending races. And things were definitely going well, you know, some wins, uh, some success. And I mean, to sum it up, I was, I was moving up the ranks. Uh, and in, in, in Cycling Ireland, you have categories from four up to one, four being the worst, uh, one being the best. And in the space of one season in 2011, I went from my first year in the, we'll say the senior ranks as a category four up to one. And that's why I won the, the, the best domestic rider award, which, which Sarah mentioned previously. And so, yeah, we're, we're well on track. Let's put it that way. Um, until, well, the, the diabetes, you can tell, is coming next. The symptoms started showing, but as a typical guy, I was kind of just shrugging it off. It's nothing. And particularly as a cyclist, you know, with a weight loss. For a cyclist, the skinnier you are, the better. So I was, I was delighted, you know. Uh, the frequent urination, I was obviously 
in my mind, I was on track of my hydration. Good job. The thirst, uh, the hunger, I just thought it's nothing. But um, at the time, I was part of the Irish under 23 development team. And the head coach just routine blood tests is what he recommended for all riders. And it, it was in those blood re results when they came back, the, the, the high A1C, high glucose levels and, and whatnot. So I went to the local GP to discuss them. And I mean, I laugh at it looking back now. He, he thought as a cyclist, you know, what, what sort of dodgy stuff are you using to, in the cycling world that could, could result in this? But uh, yeah, he ordered a second round of blood tests. And at the time I was in the University of Limerick studying to be a physical education and maths teacher. And it was when I was out on, on teaching practice in a school, like completely out of my comfort zone, I got the phone call from my mom to say, you know, where are you? I need to pick you up. And yeah, within a matter of hours, I was in the, the hospital in Limerick and I got diagnosed. That was, that was the day. So I was 19 years old at the time. That was back in 2011. Um, and well, we went to the hospital and it's, it's never anyone's the best day of anyone's life, but it went in my opinion, particularly bad because I had my first question was, what does it mean for my cycling, my passion? And along with my mom being told a couple of professions and things that are, were off the cards for me in the future, I was hoping to, to meet the, the expert, you know, to, to ask him my, my million dollar question. But the response I got was, unfortunately, that, you know, cycling is one of the most difficult sports out there. Diabetes is one of the most difficult conditions to manage. And that just trying to combine the two would probably complicate it, overcomplicate it. And I was just thinking, you know, a mile. Come on, man. What are you, what are you talking about? I, I just did 100 miles yesterday, you know. Um, so I won't lie. I was in tears. I was pretty, pretty upset, you know. Um, but thankfully it didn't last long, only a matter of hours. Seeing as I was already a cyclist, well, being a cyclist, I thought it was unfair. I thought, surely this is out of bad diet. Um, is, is it self-inflicted? Why me? This is unfair sort of thing. All, all the questions you ask yourself. But thankfully being a cyclist, I was aware of um, team type one, it was called at the time. And so going back to the doctor asking, you know, is there anything else in your pockets other than just your bananas and whatnot? And there wasn't. I remember this, this team racing on television that didn't just have bananas in their pockets. And in this case, it was weird glucose monitors and insulin pens and all this kind of stuff. So as you do, on, onto Google, I went and, and, and did some research. And the, the team had been co-founded by Phil Sutherland. He's still on board with us today. And he, he had an autobiography, which in one mind, it scared me because it's called Not Dead Yet. And he was told on his diagnosis day that well, his mother, he was, he was diagnosed when he was only a few months old, that he would probably be dead, blind, or missing a limb by the time he was a teenager. And he's since gone on to be a pro cyclist. Um, so it was scary, but uh, an opportunity at the same time. So that was it. I, I kind of thought like, well, if there's someone out there doing it, a bunch of guys, at the time it was, it was a mixed team, some people with diabetes and other riders without. Um, I thought if they can do it, why can't I? Um, so I actually lived like a kilometer away from the hospital. And <laughs> when I was released the following morning, I was, well, I was on my indoor bike, you know, doing far more than a mile, the equivalent of a mile. Um, but all went well. You know, I was checking my glucose, probably no joke, every 10 minutes. Um, and my glucose ended up in zone, in target at the end of the ride. So I was thinking, that's it, you know. It's probably just going to take a bit of time uh, to learn. But yeah, nothing's impossible sort of thing. So, I mean, from there, I, I, at the time I was working in a bike shop, also in Limerick, cycling being my, my world and everything, but it took me some time to get back to, to the level I had been at uh, in Ireland. I had signed for Ireland's best domestic team for that season. And I remember they were relying on me in the first race of the year down in Kerry uh, in March in the cold. And I was supposed to be the last guy to help the team leader. And I was dropped. I was left behind in the first 20 minutes. I was, I was like a stick insect. I was so skinny, but we knew something wasn't wrong. And that was, that was proof that the diagnosis was just around the corner. So it took some time to get back to where I'd been before. Um, some of the hurdles that I had to overcome, as you all may know, is how do you control your glucose? And uh, 
Well, that just relied on, well, when I was going out training, uh, the unwritten rule is si in cycling is kind of, if you're training, you don't stop. <laughs> you just keep going. And so me telling my mates, hey, I need to stop and check my glucose levels didn't go down too well, but they were understanding. Um, and the biggest hurdle was probably my mom, you know, don't go far away from home. I, I'd often end up in Cork or Kerry and give her a call, you know, hey, <laughs> here I am. But uh, it's all a learning curve, you know. And so getting back racing was a super special moment, you know, a stepping stone to getting back to, to where I had been previously. And I have one uh, distinct memory of a, of a race in Clare, actually, where I made it into the breakaway. For So for anyone who doesn't know cycling, the breakaway is a small group of guys who try their, their hand, their, their low chance at uh, escaping the big group and winning. So I made it into a small group with a couple of my teammates, but uh, there was probably six or seven of us. And I realized, okay, there's about an hour to go. I didn't have a CGM at the time. I must pull out my glucose monitor and do a quick test on the fly, you know? And some of my breakaway companions, they looked at me and they thought it was a phone that I was pulling out of my pocket. They're like, you can't have that. You know, you call your girlfriend, call your mom when you're, you're home and you finish the race and whatnot. Um, but I made it to the finish line and I finished fourth place. The first three guys had come in maybe two or three minutes ahead of me. And when I crossed the line, I fist pumped the air celebrations like as if I had won and I was like crying and people were coming up to me like oh you know you came fourth you didn't win but I mean for me like that was already bigger than any other win I had in my career to date you know um so I mean it proved pr proved to myself that okay it's possible here we go so it was at that point I reached out to team type one and it actually worked out really well. Nova Nordisk, uh, our sponsor for the last eight years, was coming on board. And the criteria was that it was an all-diabetes team. You know, if you want to send out a, a powerful message for people with diabetes, it has to be all diabetic. So I was reaching out to them for kind of the, the rule book, the 101 guide on how to manage diabetes with cycling. And I got, I got even better. I got a contract offer, you know, to, to become a, a pro cyclist. So I had to go to America in Atlanta where they do development camps and even to this day talent ID camps from young guys from all around the world um, with diabetes and well it obviously went well ended up deferring my studies um, quitting my job in the bike shop and a dream came true you know they say every cloud is a, a silver lining and that was definitely how, how I view it in in my case so I mean from that point onwards life has been that of a pro athlete. Um, I'm now based in Spain, partly for that reason. The, the Irish climate, as most of you know, isn't very, very good for riding a bike outside. So here we are in Spain. And yeah, I mean, I guess you want to know a little bit more about what it's like to be on the team. So it is a, a special, special, unique team. You know, the, the camaraderie, the, the unique bond that all the guys have between each other. You just, I don't think you'd find it anywhere else, you know, in the races someone's probably we even know our teammates going low before they know and you're going back to the team car to get them coke and uh it's it's really special you know so let me see i have a few notes here basically having nova nordisk on board as a sponsor the message being like the team motto is to educate empower inspire like i think all the guys love riding bikes but they probably wouldn't still be doing it or giving it 110% were it not for the, the message, you know, the, the inspiration side of the team. Um, because, yeah, I can't even describe it. You know, we go to some of the biggest races in the world, racing against guys who've won the Tour de France and whatnot. And we have this big team bus and a big team truck and everything, all plastered with changing diabetes and everything. And a kid, you know, kids often come up and for autographs and whatnot and they're pointing like oh hey dad he has the same pen or pump as me and maybe they're asking about how do i how do i manage my glucose for a 30 minute soccer game you know and maybe we've just done a, a 200 even 300 kilometer bike race or a week-long bike race i just think that that inspiration factor like i kind of needed the, a role model when i was diagnosed and to kind of feel that role myself is ah it's really heartwarming you know um super super special but i mean regarding how we do it um is probably the number one question how do we manage our glucose levels i'm pretty much self-taught um but 
listening listening to Kathy speaking now, all the, the all the science, all the evidence, and everything is kind of it it resonates with me. It rings a bell. You know, I I do have this writing that I do to burn the calories, so I can eat, so I can have. I can have chocolate. I literally had just a Spanish churros uh, before coming on air <laughs> to, to celebrate World Diabetes Day. And uh, yeah, so everyone's different. I mean, we're not going to say this is the rule book. This is the one-on-one -on -one guide of how to, to be a competitive sports person. But what we have kind of figured out is, as you may know, there's an optimal glucose level for, for daily living. And the same applies for, for performance sports, you know. So we, we aim for somewhere between 120 to 180 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So that's like six and a half to 10 millimoles. Um, but it's all personal. There's some guys in the team, if they're, if they're, we'll say 10, there's no way they could start their race. They feel horrible. There's other guys on the other end of the spectrum. Um, so it's all individual. It's, it's, it's kind of like trial and error, learning from your mistakes. But I think the, the thing that we all have in common is just, the right mindset you know learn from each other not every day is going to be perfect as kathy mentioned just do your best it's not an exact science it's never going to be perfect um but thankfully you have access you know to the latest technology um which which definitely helps a lot and in terms of foods it's nothing special it's it's a lot of the normal bar cereal bars uh and whatnot but uh always striving to improve you know um what else have i got here yeah so in terms of the team uh like 2021 is is going to mark the 100th anniversary since the discovery of insulin and also actually 100 years of Novo nordisk as a company so i don't know if you can see from the the jersey here over my shoulder that there's a number 99 that was kind of like the the the, the, the how would we say it the drum roll for for the year that's coming and so next year our jersey is going to be a, a massive celebration with 100 plastered over the front of course still with the changing diabetes logo um just to send out a super powerful message you know and we have some big big dreams and big goals um for any of you into cycling or may, maybe not even into it so much is probably aware of, of the tour de france so you have the uh the three grand tours they call them the three-week tour of, of france of Spain and Italy. So our goal is within uh, the next three years is to, to ride one of these races, you know, um, which would be special. Thankfully, Novo Nordisk are on board until that point, which is super special in these, in these times. So we, we have to be thankful for their support. Um, but yeah, we're constantly aiming to improve. And in the meantime, <laughs> training hard and uh, doing our best, you know, in our eyes, we're a pro cycling team. I guess in the beginning, people consider the team as, how would I say it, a group of guys who have diabetes who happen to own a bike and like racing. Whereas now it's kind of transformed into, ah, oh, they're a pro cycling team. And oh, did you know, by the way, they actually have diabetes, which is a cool, but like really significant transformation, you know, to see how the, the riders in the, the, the pro peloton view us, you know, the interest out of We'll say riders from other teams who should be your enemies, who should be your competitors. They say, "Ah, oh, you know, it's not just the mechanics. Oh, I must tell my niece or my nephew, the rugby player, and they want to." So the connections you make and the the message it sends out is is really really special. Uh, so really, really grateful to be on board, and hopefully I can keep doing it for for as long as I can. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, in terms of performances myself, without talking about me, 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 um, some of my best results to date, like we, that's probably the, the part I love racing on the team about most is the amount of travel we get to do, um, but also how far you get to spread the message. You know, we've raced on every continent. Um, one of the standout memories for me is, is racing in Rwanda in, in Africa. And many, many times we, <laughs> We pack our bike bags with uh, diabetes supplies and test strips and monitors and smuggle them into the country <laughs> and deliver them and then do the bike race. But uh, I remember two years ago, I was there and apparently on the radio um, beforehand, a local radio station, they were speaking about the team coming as sort of this kind of sick team, a charity organization, like they're here just for, uh, yeah to promote themselves and that they'll be lucky to even finish. And I remember a teammate of mine, a Spaniard, he, he won two stages of the race and came third overall. And so for just people with diabetes in the country, that was already like, 
wow, <laughs> we've been we've been doing it wrong all along. And 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 I guess for the leaders and the the government there was kind of an eye opener. And that that's occurred in every country we've been to. Um, just people who view diabetes as you poor thing, you can't do this, you can't do that. Whereas we're saying our choice, our way of life is 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 cycling, but that doesn't mean you can't be a pilot or whatever it is, 10K walk run. Um, so that for me is, is probably the reason I've kept doing it for eight years. I've signed on for another ninth year and absolutely loving it, but uh, yeah. I mean, for me, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, you guys probably maybe have more questions about uh, how exactly we do it with, with, with insulin units, carb ratios and whatnot. I mean, I can offer some advice, but without getting down into detail specifics, because as you know, everyone's, everyone's different. Yeah, so yeah. Say, if you're, sorry, there didn't mean to interrupt. We've got tons of questions over there. If you're still uh, looking for stuff, just let me know. We've got a ton of questions. Fire away. <laughs> All right. One, from a personal standpoint, you rock. This is awesome. As a runner, this is, yeah, this is great. Um, first question here was from Philip. He wanted to know what device do you use and do you find issues with CB CGM readings varying a lot with blood glucose during intense exercise? Uh, so at the moment, we're using Freestyle Libre sensors, and we've actually only started using them as, as of recently. So we're still in the, the early phase. Um, I think it's with anything, nothing's gonna be per perfect. And we rely on them to a certain extent. I think what we rely on mostly is, is the trends, the graphs, you know, to see the direction things are heading. Um, as a backup, everyone always carries the, the, the old school glucose meter in the car, which we're luckily in, lucky in cycling, you have access to go back to your food, your, your, your supplies. It may be difficult if you're a swimmer, for example. Um, so that's always there. Um, they're not perfect. Of course, they're still improving, but uh, put it this way, if I run out of sensors for some reason, I, <laughs> I, I don't know how I did in the past without one. So I really, really love it. But that's not to say that for people out there who don't, for one reason or another, don't have access to them, it shouldn't be a, a, hur a hurdle or a barrier from starting activity or, or exercise. You know, Most of the, the riders who come to the de development team, these talent identification camps, they don't have all, all what they need and absolutely amazing cyclists, you know, and with con control, everyone can improve their control a little bit, but that's not to say they help, but you can do it without it if, if you're unfortunate not to have access. Good points. Super, super good points. As I have my, my Libre here with, with ah, the lovely. Mio Mio, that way it's CGM instead. So just, a, just a thoughts up there. <laughs> um, another question here is from D. And her daughter is very sporty and was diagnosed two years ago at 14. And they found sports um, too difficult to manage. And they've been told to bulk up on carbohydrates pre-game, but find that the, too, the blood sugar goes too high during matches. Um, so it's become a lot of trial and error. Do you have any suggestions to help better manage the ranges pre and during games or anything that you've found works for you pre and during activity? Sure. I mean, Cycling being an endurance sport, you're obviously burning a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of carbs, a lot of fuel required. So I think Kathy mentioned, you know, carbs isn't necessarily the enemy. And in our case, it's actually our, probably our best friend, you know, it's our, it's our rocket fuel. And so we were never scared to, to load up on the carbs. Um, but again, that will vary depending on the nature of the sport. If it's a, an anaerobic effort or endurance effort, what, what your fuel source is. Um, but I wouldn't be afraid to, to bulk up on it. I think one factor that many of you are probably aware of, which is hard to put a number on it, is like race day nerves or adrenaline or this, this unknown spike pre-race totally. day. And I, I still get it to this day, even just coming on, on air now, for want of a better word, I see the spike, you know, and it's, I know it's coming. I've done these things before, but you don't know why. It just happens. And so that still happens to me on, on, on race day. Um, I think the biggest fear for me is that maybe I need to inject before the race, before the event, before, um, I can't remember which sport you mentioned. It was, did you, if you, if, oh, you, if I, I, did, I don't know if I did mention it or not on there. So but whichever, whichever sport it is, you're probably going to have some sort of, uh, uh, performance, uh, pressure, you know? Um, so the fear is to inject about to go on, on stage 
Um, but if it's happened 10 times out of the last 10 times, it's probably, it's probably okay to inject, you know, um, okay to run sugars a little bit higher than normal than your normal day of life. than while you're, while you're performing kind of to have that little buffer zone, but of course, there comes a point where it's, uh, it, it, it does inhibit your performance, you know? So we're lucky in that we can see, as anyone with diabetes who's into sport, you can see the reason why you should control your diabetes as best you can. You're rewarded, you know, you, you perform better, you feel better. And I think it would be great for everyone, the general population to realize like, okay, it's a pain in the ass, but you put, put in effort and you're, you're gonna be rewarded, you know? It's, it's kind of, you get out what you put in. Yeah, super, super good points. And I can definitely echo as a, not a professional runner, but my, my blood sugar goes through the roof before I do a race. But if I take too much, I'm like, so right. low by the end of it. I'm like, oh, I just did a 10K, but what, what's my blood sugar going there? <laughs> like, yeah, that's not, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah, not ideal. Yeah. Actually, speaking about running in this, this is my off season period. These last two weeks, I get back to work on Monday. I did a couple of 10K runs. And as a cyclist, I need like, five days to recover just <laughs> not for me <laughs> well if you were here in limerick you could have gone out with me this morning without for a jog this ah. morning so you know we could have had a good one there <laughs> um another question on here um from jennifer she wants to know how do you find the freestyle libre with accuracy um i know you're mentioning a little bit of this earlier she said she's used it um but scanned like only scanned my arm one day and checked my blood glucose monitor and i had gone into hypo so i guess the a difference there it sounds like between the scan and the, um, and the reading on the glucose meter. Have you noticed differences along those lines? Uh, I mean, if I'm completely honest, I'm still new to the product. So, and, and, and a better point still is we're actually not supposed to are allowed to go into the specifics of, of products and, and we'll say their performance. But um, what I will say is that I think every CGM has some sort of lag, be it five minutes, be it 10 minutes. To always be aware of that um, and if it is one of those super important readings ideally you can do the finger stick method it's not always possible um, but just to be aware of that lag maybe you rely more on the trends i think that's the biggest for me the biggest benefit as i mentioned before but yeah sorry i can't be more specific until i've i've tried it for a little bit longer no that that totally totally makes sense um let's see another question out here for you is Let's see here. Um, there are plenty of options out there in sport. When you have time off, do you find it challenging to adjust with the dosages, et cetera? How do you find, you know, you said you were taking your time off and getting ready to go back in. So how, how has your routine kind of changed during those pieces there or during that time off? No, no, that's, it's definitely a good question and comes at an appropriate time, as you mentioned, because us as professional sports people, what we consider our normal day means three, four hours of training every day. And so the, the abnormal days are when you do nothing, which is usually the, the reverse of the general population. So now for me, this challenging time has been adjusting to this uh, reduced insulin sensitivity. And of course, the, the, the dosages. Um, and I see it even if I'm injured or like I meant to mention earlier in the, in the talk was all the factors that we do encounter while traveling. You know, you have the time zone difference, yeah. you're you're in China and like Kathy mentioned, you get a plate of noodles that you've never seen before. There's no nutritional label, even altitude, you know, go race in, in Utah or something at 3000 meters. All of these factors, um, again, we haven't put a number on them, but through trial and error, you try and learn what happened last time. So for me in this off season period, it's definitely uh, a lot more insulin. That's for sure. Um, Part of the, the reason being the inactivity and part of the reason is it's that kind of one time of year where I have churros more often than, than I usually do. <laughs> oh, I, I shouldn't show you the chocolates that I have here next to me, I guess. Uh, the, better not. Christmas, better chocolates. Not. Christmas chocolates are out here. Just, just saying if you ever go, go shop in here yet. <laughs> um, another question out here was from James. He wanted to know what is your best carb routine before a training session? Yeah, so... Again, everyone being individually, usually what I find works good for me is if it's an important training or, or a race, I usually try and eat my, my breakfast, my, my pre-training meal three hours before. At least, at least that way I can get, unless it's a super fatty meal, which, which it usually isn't, I can usually kind of uh, follow the trends, get it in target before starting riding. And 
we'll say the the, the composition, the nutri uh, nutritional composition will depend on if it's a, a six hour base endurance, like zone two, a fat burning session, mm -hmm. or whether it's a, a high intensity one, you know, and that, that will also impact the choice of how much food I bring, how much, whether it's just water or a mixed drink with energy in the bottles. Um, but yeah, my, my technique is usually three hours and we apply that to races because usually what we say, you say what you do in training, you do in racing. Um, so three hours before, um, then monitoring throughout, I would say if I can't see the, the, the glucose monitor in front of me on a watch on a bike computer, I pull it out of the pocket every 15 minutes at a minimum. And that's if I don't see an alarm or, or some sort of alert. So mm -hmm. every 15 minutes you're checking it. Um, and again, they say you can eat 50 to 80 grams of carbs per hour when you're, when you're racing, you know, which is a lot. That can be four, five bars, you know, it's a lot of food. And, but many times we don't even need to inject. That just shows how much the, the body is just sucking the muscles or absorbing that, that fuel. So we're lucky in that sense. We have a, a reason to eat. Um, but that goes on throughout the, the course of the, the, the training or racing. And the recovery is the same as, as someone without diabetes, you know, replenish the stores, never scared of carbohydrates. Half our team is Italian. So we have lots of pasta, lots of pasta and uh, pizza on occasion. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that just, you need to be aware of, say, if it was a super demanding session and you, you need to be aware that your, your sensitivity ratios, which Kathy mentioned, they can change not even on a daily basis, within half a day, depending on what you've done in the morning. So always just, thankfully I was studying maths in university. I've kind of got this mathematical mind in the back of my head that's working in overdrive. It's never perfect, but uh, you need to be aware, constantly on top of your game. That's awesome. Yeah, as, as a teacher by training, my brain is always like, okay, how do I math, do, how does my math do all these different pieces? How can my brain do all those things? So I totally get you on that one. Yeah. Um, I have Mark. Mark has a question for you here. Um, he's great to see your team at some of the classics on Eurosport over the past few years. He wanted to know what is the schedule looking like for Team Nova in 2021? And he said just he's basically a newly diagnosed cyclist and cannot seem to get control of his blood. So there's some other stuff with it, but he really wants to know what's, what's it looking like for 2021? Yeah, so obviously with, with COVID and whatnot, this past season has been a, a crazy one. I did one single race day in Greece and that was it. Um, so it was a little bit unusual. We, we actually just did a training camp, uh, a gathering of all the team together in Greece just a month ago to prepare for the 2021 season. And for now it's still a little bit up in the air, but we would hope to still do a predominantly European calendar. So if it's similar to in the past, Milan San Remo, which is the, the world's longest one day bike race, 299K. So. 1K short of 300. Um, then Tour of Poland, you've got a couple of one-day races in Spain. In the past, we've done Tour of Britain, for example. Unfortunately, there no longer exists a, a Tour of Ireland, but if there was, we'd be there, I, I'm sure of it. But uh, yeah, a lot of Italian racing. Um, and if we're lucky and things worldwide are good, we, we usually do a lot of Asian racing as, as well in Thailand, in, in, in China. We usually spend about a month or two in China. Again, the names of the races, don't ask me, I couldn't pronounce them, but um, it's a pretty worldwide schedule. And if we're lucky, South America is usually where we begin. So in, in Brazil or Colombia and, and Rwanda. So again, it's, it's, it's gonna be a strange season. We've, we've been checking like weekly, daily updates of travel restrictions and yeah, it's a mad world, but uh, we hope, hope to see some sort of normality. We can race our bikes in 2021. Well, start working on getting it back here in Ireland. So, you know, got to, got to work on that piece for us here. Exactly. Um, another one here. Oh, I just lost it there from Simon. He wants to know, do you get spikes in your blood sugar levels hours after racing or training? Do you ever notice the spike that comes or is there a dip that comes like either, either kind of those sort of pieces from the heavier sure. training? Not, not so much, to be honest, um, unless it's been a incredibly large meal that I've had afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that maybe, yeah, maybe in the first two hours, your, your, your body was just sucking it all in. And then you have that, that graph that we saw earlier, just tapering back up in the end. Um, unless it's like ridiculous meal, then I usually don't. One of the, the, the biggest questions or biggest fears of most people is, is the lows, the hypos in the night. Um, 
for me, it's, I'm quite lucky that, as I said, what I do is quite consistent. I train every day. So my, uh, my basal, I can adjust that accordingly and avoid the lows. But I think that is the biggest concern for most people is, 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 is the drops, you know? Um, and in my experience, that usually happens if I simply haven't refueled properly after the ride, you know? Um, I mean, most people have access to, say, activity trackers now that count your calories and energy expenditure. And it would blow your mind how many calories you can burn in a, in a, in a 10K run or something. And just don't be afraid to indulge a little bit. You do need to replenish those stores. Otherwise, yeah, you might see the, the, the trend dropping. And I don't think anyone's going to say no to <laughs> replenishing stores. Yeah, I... As, as, when I did my, my first and only marathon, I was like, yep, I love carbs. Yes, bring, bring them on. They are awesome. <laughs> Rocket um, fuel. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, that kind of brings it into like that carb question there. Um, is the quantity of carbs you need to train and compete, has it impacted your weight at all? Or have you noticed anything on that side of it? That's from Elaine. Yeah, I mean, it can. Uh, like in this time, it's natural that we gain a little bit of weight. Cyclists in general, the, the power to weight ratio is huge. So, I mean, usually the first thing you do when you attend a, a team camp or event is they check your, your body fat percentage, you know, instead of shaking hands, they grab your, 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 your love handles, you know? So uh, we're, we're constantly aware of the, the weight. Um, and that does tie in with, with the carbs we, we consume. Um, but it is, I guess, for people with diabetes, a little bit more of a balancing act. You know, you reduce the carbs to try and, or, or calorie intake to reduce your, uh, your weight. Um, but then you need to be aware of how that impacts your glucose. So yeah, some guys will try to maybe fasted training, uh, pre breakfast. If you've never done it before, I it's, it's, I'm not going to say risky business, but, uh, yeah, you need to know what you're doing. Um, or even just low intensity, um, training, you know, long endurance training, you can restrict the carbs, train your body to, to rely more on the fat. Um, and again, we have all the latest technology power meters, which measures the, the, the force that we exert and that we can determine with uh, oxygen exchange, like without getting too scientific, which fat yeah. source or which, which energy source you're, you're burning from. But for just for the general population, you know, a walk, it should be fat burning. A jog is probably moving into burning sugars. And you'll see that with your glucose as well. And so if we want to restrict carbs, maybe lose a little bit of weight. Um, it's, it's in this month that's coming up ahead of me just long hours on the bike, low intensity, uh, teach the body how to, to burn those excessive fat stores. <laughs> oh, true. So true. I, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm just going to smile and nod and say, yes, everything you're saying there. I, I get totally, it. totally get it. Um, <laughs> another question here. How did you extend your mileage and increase your power when you were first diagnosed to get back to that 100 miles of riding? Yeah. So at first I was literally doing not quite laps of the block, but just staying close to home within 5k in, in case anything went wrong. Um, and I literally packed a lunch box every time I went out and brought a, brought so much food just in case, you know, you can never be better safe than sorry, you know, and just, I would say over the course of a month, gradually increased it half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours until, yeah, until you realized maybe the biggest thing for the people who are newly diagnosed is maybe establishing some sort of routine. Okay, this bar contains 15 grams of carbs. I'm going to eat one every 30 minutes, every 60 minutes. And that's, again, going to depend on the intensity. It's going to depend on your basal, you know, whatever insulin is on board. So just establishing some routine was, for me, the biggest hurdle to overcome to, to be able to do those distances again. Um, and just being, being prepared. You know, in the past, you could probably just last minute throw on some kit, head out for a ride, no food, nothing, and just wing it effectively. Whereas now you had the hurdle of always having your money, always having an emergency gel in your pocket, always, yeah, not being out in the sticks without, without anything. So just being prepared was probably the, the biggest hurdle. And when you lose that fear, that being scared of what if, what if, what if, you get to enjoy the training again. You get to increase the miles. Like you have what you need. You have all your supplies. Um, and you can enjoy it. So yeah, just establishing a routine and, and being prepared, you know, it's, it's no harm if you end up coming home with half the food, it's better have it than, than not have it. 
right? Or having to, to a low somewhere and being someplace who knows where you are and having, exactly. having something not so positive happening there. Exactly. I mean, these days with modern technology, you have the, we'll say the, the wrist IDs with emergency contact phone numbers, uh, the fitness trackers that can share your live location to, to, to loved ones in case something happens. Like all this yeah. technology can just take off one little bit of stress. And of course, as we all know, stress also affects your blood sugar levels. So the more comfortable you make it for yourself, I think the more you can enjoy it. You know, there's, there's days I ride my bike and I forget, oh, I should probably check my sugar. You know, I've actually got diabetes, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're the good days, you know. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it looks like we've got time or about the 12, 13. So we've got time for a couple more, a couple more questions out of here. Um, let's see here. So would you consider pump therapy integrated system to get better control versus injections? What do you think about, you know, kind of the injections? What have you or your teammates been kind of comparing injections to pump to, I know you're talking now, you're starting to use the Libre, CGM, how does all that kind of fit in for you and your sure. training? I mean, for me, um, since the day of diagnosis, I've actually never tried a pump. <laughs> I've kind of adopted the approach, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it sort of thing. Um, but seeing with, with the amazing technology and the progress that's being made, I'm definitely open to anything that can help me improve. But it is one of the things that uh, most people see us at conferences, at races, like with the Lycra, it's not very forgiving and you can't really hide anything too well. Where's the pump? Where's the... And, yeah. and the, the truth is the majority of us don't have it. Um, but I see in the last, the last season or two, some guys trying it, loving it, and people go on and off. So for me, it's always been, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but I'm definitely open to it because now I'm just on MDI, just regular injections. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's working so far, but uh, yeah, if I could re reduce my A1C half a percent, I'm all in, you know? Exactly, exactly. Well, it's just about our time here. I think we're at 12, 15, Enish. Any final words of wisdom or anything else out there that you're like, oh, I want to, this is something I didn't get to mention that I really want to say to folks and keep them motivated or things along those lines. Not so much, only just, I think your mindset is so powerful and super important with diabetes. Just like from day one, okay, I had those few hours of depression and tears but from then on where it's just like okay if someone else is doing it I can just it could be a lot worse as we all know and, and just get on with it you know it's never going to be perfect just learn from your mistakes and yeah it could be worse do your best and that's that's all we can do really so yeah I guess control your diabetes and don't let it control you effectively cool well, thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us here today. Like I, yeah. like I said, as a fellow athlete, not to the same caliber, I love it. Like your advice and your enthusiasm totally pumps me up. So just want to say a huge thanks to you there. Same to you. Thanks.